Hi, I'm Mac Earhart, uh, president of Albert Lee Seed. Thanks very much for coming today. And for those of you that are watching this online, thanks for taking the time to, to be with us today. So Jake Hansen and I are going to launch and just talk a little bit about uh, the 2021 season and then uh, some high points of our corn and soybean lineup that, you think, that we think you might be interested in if you're making product selection. And I think I'll let, uh, well, this is the this is the overview, kind of the topics of what we're going to talk about, and we'll jump right into it right away, but we're going to talk about those topics there. And the first thing we're going to talk about is a little year in review, and I'm going to let uh, Jake take on that. Take that. Sure. Okay, thanks. Margaret says I've got to hold the microphone closer. All right. Well, I think most of us remember how the year went. Um, whether, whether you liked it or not, we were in a pretty severe drought for much of the uh, northern and western Corn Belt. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that I noticed this year, um, both with my test plots and personally at home, much earlier planting dates and those, you know, the planting conditions ranged a little bit. I know my fields were extremely dry on real heavy clays that are traditionally extremely wet. Um, so things were definitely kind of out of what I would call the norm for, at least for me and probably for a lot of uh, our customers. Uh, I know throughout the summer, most guys are praying for rain. Some didn't get it. Some would get just enough to uh, keep that corn or beans alive, uh, it seemed like. Um, did notice that those roots this year, especially in corn, were chasing that moisture down uh, through the soil profile. I heard a lot of stories of uh, root digs that were going eight, 10 feet deep um, and still finding corn roots that deep. So it was definitely a case of some strong root systems that were chasing moisture down. Uh, one other thing we noticed was we were gaining growing degree units extremely fast this year. Uh, I, I got a, one of my colleagues sent me a, an email that said that you could have grown 105 day corn in Canada this year. Um, that's just how fast they were, grow they were uh, gaining heat units. And then finally, uh, these late summer rains, some of us got, saw some of it in early August. Um, much of us saw it in late August, early September. So late soybeans in that uh, 2.0, north of a 2.0 bean, 2.4, and corn in the 105 day really took advantage of that because they were still filling out. They were still filling pods, still filling up that ear. Um, so I was seeing in my uh, replicated trials, which I'll also talk about here, they were seeing anywhere uh, 5 to 10 bushel diff, um, better on 100 day to 95 day, and upwards of 15 bushel more in 105 day corn compared to 100 day corn in plots that were planted in the same area. Uh, not that it really needs to be hashed out too much, but these are just some drought maps of the progression this year and how we went from mid-May uh, in the uh, top left corner um, all the way through uh, mid-August in the bottom right there. So as you can see, it just kept getting worse and worse. And I think the September map, which I didn't leave up there, was even more severe in that, in that, uh, in that August one. So one thing, Jake did not introduce himself, so Jake Hansen is our corn and soybean agronomist, and we'll talk about our testing program in a minute, but Jake spends a lot of time walking corn and soybean plot, uh, variety trials throughout the upper Midwest, and he's really the person here that really sharpens the pencil and helps us pick the corn and the corn hybrids and the soybean varieties that we, that we carry, and he also answers a lot of the day-to-day -day questions on, especially on conventional corn and soybean agronomy. So the thing I wanted to add to this, which we're up here to talk mostly about corn and soybeans, but um, this map affected other crops too, right? And so, and it also didn't stop at the Canadian border. So we sell a lot of oats, wheat, and barley seed as well. And one thing I'm, I'm here to tell you is those prices are much higher, both for the grains and for the seed. And there are significant seed shortages this year in some of the small grains. So just be aware of that if you're uh, intending to plant a small grain, of oat, wheat, barley, even something like buckwheat, uh, there's limited supplies and prices are really high because the major small grain producing areas in the Dakotas and across the border into Canada uh, had extremely dry weather and in some places they literally were blanked. They, they just got nothing, so. All right, thanks, Mac. Uh, another thing that I saw this year in uh, all my travels, a um, couple of diseases that were really popping up in a lot of different places. One of them, the first one there being Fusarium crown rot. Um, 
you know, most of us know it, most fields have it. It survives in the crop residue and it usually infects early. Um, a lot of times you don't see a lot of systems until those plants are severely stressed. Um, typically, at least in my head, I have always asso associated fusarium or most crown rots with, uh, with wet conditions. Although this year, if they were infected early and the, didn't really see symptoms until later, extreme drought conditions can also uh, make this, this typical disease um, really, really show its symptoms. Um, I was getting some reports in, uh, in eastern Nebraska and some in South Dakota where we were seeing some, some stock rots developing uh, down low, largely due to something like this coming in early, but not really um, showing much symptoms until later. And then the other one that I talked about last year, and I'll talk about again this year, because it was a problem, specifically out in uh, out east, uh, is tar spot. And we're still learning. This is still a very new disease to the U.S. Um, so we're really trying to figure it out. And right now, you know, fungicides definitely help. Um, they will kind of keep that plant healthier. Even with uh, the later infections, it can still uh, still improve overall yields with those fungicide applications. Um, but yeah, the big question is on the bottom there, did it hurt yield? I don't know. Um, the, uh, the plots that I walked in northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin that were real heavy with, uh, with tar spot, there was definitely some hybrid differences between genetics, um, but when the yield results came back, I didn't see a big difference with the hybrids that are heavily infected to the hybrids that were still pretty healthy. Um, there was not a huge yield difference to really say for sure, yeah, tar spot hurt that one, or was it just some other field condition or just the growing season in general. But like I said, we're still learning. Um, genetic um, suppliers are also still learning, and they are doing their best um, to do, give better ratings on these, as well as myself. I took a lot of notes on a lot of plots with, uh, that were, had some tar spot. And it's slowly making its way west. We were seeing it, uh, some reports even in Free Warren County here um, with tar spot. I know you got into southeast Minnesota and there was quite a bit of it out that way as well. So we're still trying to gather more information. Um, right now, I, my, my best defense is um, hybrid selection and that later fungicide application. A uh, little bit about our, our seed testing. Uh, Mac talked a little bit about it. Uh, right now, uh, our replicated trials for corn and soybeans, I tested around 90 different varieties of soybeans and about 100 different variety or corn hybrids, uh, ranging from a 77 day all the way up to 114. And we hit these the testing sites in seven states, um, two replications uh, per location, so the, that's a lot of seed to look at or a lot of plants to look at and take some notes on. And also, we enter into University of Minnesota, Iowa State, and FIRST trials as well. So this is the map of the upper Midwest, um, and each one of those green dots represents a corn testing site, and each one of the brown dots represents a soybean site. Uh, so as you can see, I put a lot of miles on the truck. Um, I hit as many of these sites as I possibly can, um, starting in mid-September to uh, mid-October, and I got to about 75% of them this year, so I was pretty happy with it. Jake's going to show you a little bit of data. We're not, we're not going to really go through this data at, in depth at all, although if you're interested and you want to see the results of these trials, we're happy to share that information with you. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. So these are, again, these are all our internal trials. So these are trials that we pay for, we put in. Uh, through a cooperative testing service, and they're randomized and replicated, and it, what we put in here is our existing hybrids, uh, some industry checks from Pioneer and DeKalb, and a few other companies, and then we also put uh, experimentals, so up-and-coming commercial hybrids that we're considering launching uh, it's, um, maybe the next year or maybe two years later, because we'd like to get a, a good look at these hybrids and look at, you know, obviously you can see yield there, you can see moisture, you can see test weight, you can see root lodging, you can see stock lodging. But the other thing, as Jake mentioned, is it allows him to get out and see these hybrids and soybean varieties in different environments across the upper Midwest. And that really helps our team with product placement. So we spend time going through our, our, our products with everybody on our sales team so that when you come to us and ask us, 
well, I have this sandier field, or I have a field that, even though it's tiled, it's all, you know, in a wet year, it's always really wet, or it has a particular problem. We can help you place hybrids and soybean varieties in those areas because we have, a, through Jake and this testing network, we have really good no a working knowledge of, of our different varieties. Sure. Um, and yeah, so the other piece of that is we have, you know, our Viking corn and soybeans a few years back, we switched to 100% non-GMO, and then we also have our Viking organic brand. So we don't, we no longer carry in the Viking brand, we don't carry Roundup Ready corn or Smart Stacks corn. And um, the question comes up, and we, we sort of take it for granted, so we, you know, it's one of those things, since you live it every day, you don't really think about it. But... Um, this question comes up periodically, well, do conventional hybrids really yield as much as traded hybrids? And the answer is unequivocally, yes, they do. We just sort of take it for granted internally, we don't talk about it a lot. But in the absence of rootworm or corn borer pressure, the conventional genetics are every bit as good as what you can buy in a smart stacks bag or an acre max bag. It doesn't mean that there's not a place for those hybrids on, on conventional farms where there's a significant root potential for rootworm problem, or maybe it's a year where there's a big corn borer problem. But in the absence, or, the, or the, if you have another method of controlling those insect pests, uh, you can get as much or more yield out of these conventional hybrids. And the results speak for themselves. These are first trials from, from 2021. Uh, you can just see where uh, some of these hybrids are showing up in first place out of 60 hybrids, in first place out of 70 hybrids. And again and again and again, these products are, are just doing extremely well. So if you have the ability to plant conventional corn on your farm, uh, plant it with confidence, because you're not giving up any yield at all. Uh, if you are able to control the rootworm or uh, corn borer. All right, we'll start getting into a little bit of our hybrid selection here, specifically on corn to start with. Um, so these are just some of the questions that uh, we like to ask uh, of our customers. Um, early versus full season. You know, how much yield do you think you're gonna give up? Well, I highlighted a little bit uh, here earlier you know, this year in particular, we were seeing 95-day hybrids given up 5 to 10 bushel over 100 days, some 100 days given up 15 or more uh, over 105 days. A lot of that has to do with the year. Like I said, those, those late rains in uh, August, September really benefited the late maturing corns a lot better. Um, you know, some other questions, are we going to be, are you going to try to diversify with some cover crops? So then we got to think about maybe adjusting your maturities, try to get it harvested a little earlier. Um, you know, so then that, that brings up the question, well, what early hybrids can we bring south? Um, dry down concerns. Do you have a dryer set up? Uh, do, you, do you go straight to town? You want to dry down in the field? And then obviously planting dates always come into play. Um, can we get in early? Yeah, we could this year. Can, can we next year? Well, if I could answer that, I don't know that I'd really need to work much more, would I? Um, but yeah, or if you're incorporating cover crops, Mother Nature always throws curveballs at us as well. You know, the next question um, to bring up is some field conditions. Uh, what are we looking at for soil types? Are we looking at high fertility, low fertility, um, heavy wet soils like my ground in particular is extremely heavy, hard pan clay. Um, that can be tough to work with sometimes. You know, holds water like a sponge, doesn't drain unless you've got tile every 20 feet. Um, but I've got some hybrids that I'm very comfortable and I myself have planted. Um, 5296, 9900 are a couple of my top go-tos top go um, on some wet ground. Uh, 8405, 4808 have definitely proven themselves in those situations as well. Um, this year, everything was drought prone. So now we gotta start thinking, okay, again, lighter sand, re gravelly, um, quick drainage even without tile. So there's plenty of hybrids that we have that also match that. Um, 5195, 5200, uh, a pair of sisters that have proven themselves real well uh, on droughty soils. You know, we keep going a little bit deeper. You know, high production, like I mentioned, those, that nice flat black dirt with good fertility, uh, good organic matter, good pH. You know, you know racehorse ground, what do, you get, what do we got that can handle that? Well, there's a good list right there that uh, uh, again, improved themselves. 5502 definitely jumps out as a very racehorsey type hybrid that uh, definitely flexes a lot of yield if the conditions are right, if it's not stressed too far, um, wet or dry. Uh, 
Again, a little deeper, low production ground. What do we got? Uh, you have any fields that have what we call yield ceilings, meaning no matter what you do to it, no matter how much fertilizer you pour onto it, that yield never hits higher than 180. Um, you don't necessarily need to throw out, you know, the best yielding hybrid on that ground. <clears throat> you know, we kind of introduced last year our, our workhorse hybrids uh, with 8884 and 8894. Uh, those are a, a pair that definitely work really well in those type of environments. They've got pretty good drought tolerance. Um, they flex a lot of a lot of ear girth, a lot of ear length, um, so they will respond to that uh, population variance. Uh, finally, uh, corn on corn. Um, Mac talked about a little bit earlier. You know, what's your rootworm management like? Um, you know, corn borer things like that. Uh, the other thing to consider is uh, your residue management, because um, a lot of corn diseases overwinter on that residue, right? So that's something to always keep in mind. You want to try to pick some defensive hybrids, something with good roots, uh, something with decent emergence. You know, 5200, um, I would also throw in another hybrid on there. Uh, 9900, I feel, is another one that's going to do really well in uh, a corn on corn situation. <coughs> so now to talk about just a few individual hybrids here. This year. Um, starting with an 83 day, kind of kind of an ultra early, something that you wouldn't generally think of down in this in this country, but I can say with confidence uh, that this one will come south extremely well. You know, planted in early May up in Wells, Minnesota, this thing was standing neck and neck um, with uh, 5195, 9900. You know, hybrids that are over 10 days in maturity longer than it. You know, it kept itself together, it kept its plant health, it didn't fall apart like, I, like some people would normally think about that early of a hybrid. So if you're thinking of replant situation or you're, you're cover cropping and you want to plant later, this is still a good option. <clears throat> the other new one this year uh, is 106 day, so I'm kind of going the other way uh, as far as maturity goes. This one you're definitely going to be chasing a lot of top end yield, um, and it proved it. We had this one tested this year and last year in our replicated trials, and it uh, took top spots both years. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're definitely seeing an improvement in yield with this hybrid, kind of a, ne a next step. <coughs> if it had one weakness, I would say it's test weight. It's going to be a pound or two lighter than a lot of hybrids around it in that similar maturity. But the overall health, uh, the emergence on this hybrid, are really second to none. I do like this one a lot. It kept its health uh, all season long across all locations. You want, you want to grab one, Jake? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I wanted to say, Jake touched on this a little uh, in his earlier slides when he was talking about adaptability and southerly movement. We, we encountered this uh, initially with mostly with organic growers who just because of weed control issues tend to plant much later than conventional farmers. And so they are planting earlier hybrids in zones where, just for example, locally, if somebody would plant 100 or 105 day corn, the organic farmer would be planting a 95 day corn, right? So slightly early because they're planting later. And so we, that was when we started looking for hybrids and soybean varieties that would adapt to that southerly movement because not all early hybrids and early soybean varieties move south well because they don't handle the stress as well and, or for various reasons. Soybeans because they're day length sensitive, corn might be another issue. So one thing that, we've, that we started to do on the organic side, but it's now become a bigger deal on the conventional side of our business as well uh, because of cover cropping. We're trying to identify hybrids and soybean varieties that move south extremely well so that if you're trying to integrate uh, a cover crop and give it more time to grow in the fall. Um, maybe you're gonna try a roll down system that we're gonna talk about later today, or for some other reason, you need a wider window for your cover crop. Uh, which, which hybrids and which soybean varieties can come south and do a good job um, south of the zone where you normally would plant them? So Jake, up here he has one right now, 7783, uh, that he's identified as you know an ultra early. You wouldn't normally plant that this far south. But throughout our lineup, we're trying to do that. We're not going to just carry hybrids that do that, but we're definitely going out of our way. Jake's going out of his way, and we're thinking about it all the time. Well, of the available varieties, do we, can we find one that does move south extremely well 
that would give uh, farmers an opportunity for a wider window, a wider window of opportunity for cover cropping. And th it's just one example. Yep. All right, thanks, Mac. Um, I'm going to skip a few hybrids here in our lineup and jump to a pair um, that, uh, as I said before, these are sister hybrids. 5195 has always been our best-selling 95-day hybrid ever. Um, and it still holds true. That thing is still a great hybrid. A little bit shorter stature, uh, excellent, excellent drought tolerance on it. Um, we've, just, we've always liked it, and it's one that does move south. I've sold this thing in northern Illinois. Um, to customers and it's always done well for them as well. But uh, one thing I learned new this year about the 5296 um, is its overall plant health and disease resistance is phenomenal. Um, that really helped carry it a little bit later into the season, taking more advantage of the late rains this year over the 5195. I'd always, in my head anyway, thought the 5195 had a little better drought tolerance. But this year proved that 5296 can be just as good um, as far on that drought tolerance. And a lot of it comes from its overall plant health, keeping it together greener just a little bit longer, took a little more advantage of the later rains. Um, so I'm not afraid of 5296 going, into, going west, going on droughty soils. I think this year of all years, uh, to prove it's, it's salt in that uh, situation, uh, it definitely, definitely outperformed my expectation this year. <clears throat> uh, jumping ahead again to another heavy hitter here that uh, uh, Carl likes to remind me all the time that this was an organic hybrid first and then we added it to our conventional lineup usually it's the other way around um, but uh, phenomenal yield on this one it took the drought um, extremely well you can see there on the uh, its successes in first trials and other university trials and our trials. Um, this was just a phenomenal hybrid. The overall plant health on this thing is great. Um, it stood green a lot longer than others. Um, even in areas where tar spot seemed to be a, a big problem, uh, it didn't seem to affect it. <coughs> um, it still yielded very, very well. Uh, southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois. So. Uh, definitely a 102 day that can take stress and still still bring some yield. Uh, a couple more hybrids. You know why 205 days? Well, I think this comes down to two things: stress and location. So the way I kind of split these two hybrids out, 8405. That's my southern pick. If you're going to push a hybrid at then 105 maturity south into Iowa, into Illinois, Nebraska. That's the one I'm going to go with. I'll, I'll, I'll advise that one every time. Probably the most consistent looking hybrid I have ever seen uh, in my 10 years with the seed house looking at these trials uh, from Champaign, Illinois to Omaha, Nebraska, all the way up to Olivia, Minnesota. Just a fantastic looking hybrid. Last two years it's proved its salt in terms of yield, drought tolerance, uh, disease tolerance, it's just been a great hybrid. 4205, that one, we start pushing that one north. That's definitely my northern pick, and uh, if you're going to push this, push 105 day up to Highway 14 or 212 here in Minnesota, that's usually one I'm going to recommend. You start getting on that flat black dirt, that one can handle it really well. It is a bit more of a racehorse type hybrid. You stress it too far wet or too far dry, and it's going to lose out to the 8405. But in those high yielding environments, that's definitely one that uh, holds its own. It always butts heads with 8405 in those situations. <clears throat> it's gonna be a little bit shorter, uh, but still carries a lot of good disease tolerance in those situations as well. Mac, do you wanna talk about the yeah. silage? Sure, so we do, we do, at this point, we do not carry specialty silage hybrids. So we don't have a brown midrib or a leafy hybrid that we sell conventionally. What we carry instead are hybrids that we've identified as having uh, excellent quality for silage, and that means they provide both a lot of tonnage and really good quality. And we don't just 
guess this, this isn't, we say, oh, that's a tall hybrid, it'll make a good silage shepherd. We actually put them in trials, uh, either with university or in private testing, and identify those hybrids that are going to produce a lot of tonnage per acre and a lot of milk per acre, and then we, and then we call those dual purpose, or in the organic lineup, we call them GS hybrids, or stands for grain silage. And so they're hybrids, literally, we have good data on that we, we are very confident they're going to compete um, for, for silage quality and tonnage. For both ca for for livestock producers, and we and then we've identified. I think up here right now we've got four different hybrids, and we're comparing them to some Master's Choice and some Dairyland products. And we have a few. Other, we don't have every single product up there, but those are those are the four or five that we uh, that we wanted to put up here right now. I'm not going to talk about each of them, but I just wanted to let you know we have very strong. Con if we identify a hybrid as a dual purpose or a grain silage. Uh, we have super um, strong confidence that it's going to perform in that environment. And this come well, I guess I'll, we're going to run out of time, so I'll, I'm going to stop there. There's a new one, uh, 114 day this year that's also done well uh, in silage trials. It's not up on this. That's yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. And then just wanted to throw a plug in uh, for traded some traded corn and soybeans <clears throat> that we also sell here at the seed house um, you know we like to we, we like to make sure that we're including you know all farming practices we don't want to we don't want to just be limiting to one thing so we've always sold traded corn and beans uh, in a viking bag uh, we did when I first started here um, but we wanted to continue that we didn't want to just say nope we're done so what we did was we partnered with a couple of different brands uh, Anderson Seeds is uh, they're out of St. Peter, Minnesota. We've been working with them for 30 years. 30 years. Um, they've been growing a lot of our conventional seed corn, um, and they have their own line of, of uh, traded products uh, from straight Roundup Ready all the way up to uh, Smart Stacks corn. Um, so I want to make let everyone know that we have those available. And then on the bean side for Roundup Beans, uh, we partnered with Stein uh, and have a, a Stein lineup from a 0.9 up to a 2.4 maturity, and those are all the enlist trait. Uh, and just real quick, the enlist, that's Roundup, Liberty, and the 2,4-D formulation. Uh, so uh, if you want to extend beans, unfortunately, we don't have those with us right now. Now we'll talk a little bit about soybeans. <clears throat> Here again, a lot of the same questions come up as uh, I talked about with the corn. Um, early versus full maturity. Well, this year, if you planted that 2-4 bean to try to push your maturities, uh, you definitely benefited. Um, you know, our best yielding bean this year was our 24-18s. Um, you know, they definitely took advantage of some late rains. But we don't want, don't want to uh, discount the early beans that still performed well, um, brought down south as an early planting option. So things to consider, planting date, a lot of the same things I talked about with corn. Planting date, are we trying to get in early? Are you trying to let a cover crop do a little more work for you and then plant your beans? Um, you know, what's your weed control like? Things like that. Those are all questions that we got to ask ourselves uh, and that we like to ask you as well before we, you know, get full recommendations on these beans. Um, but just sort of real quick about some beans that can move south extremely well. Uh, 0821s, 1218s, uh, 1518s had a great year in my trials. Um, you can ask me about that data later. They really stood out, yielding up with the two O's again this year. Um, but 0821, we've had that one down in northern Iowa, and it and, uh, competed right with 2 O, two ones, or you know 2155s, which have been a great one for us. <clears throat> uh, some other field conditions to think about with soybeans: uh, cyst nematodes. Uh, if you if you've got them heavy, if not, great. I know they're around. I know I've got them on my ground. Um, PI88788, that's been the gene that's been in most of your cyst-tolerant beans around, and it's starting to lose its effectiveness. Um, so what do we do about that? Well, we look elsewhere. We do have a couple of Peking varieties, 1940s, 2340s, um, that have performed extremely well. And, and I'll admit it, even with myself, I had always thought that Peking, you know, there was a yield drag to it. And that may have been the case originally when it first came out. Not so much a story anymore with these two new beans. 2340s, right up there, the last two years, with some of our best yielders and some of the industry best yielders. 
And then some diseases to, to keep in mind that are always, uh, that are always on my mind anyway, white mold, brown stem rot, sudden death syndrome. Those are th three heavy hitters, especially here in southern Minnesota, northern Iowa, uh, that are always ones to think about. White mold wasn't as big of a problem in the last couple of years because we've been so dry. Uh, that definitely needs uh, some more moisture to really infect heavy. But sudden death syndrome, that's one that's sneaky because it infects early and symptoms don't show up until August usually in the, in the form of chlorosis on the leaves. But there are options out there for uh, varietal options for higher tolerance and there are some seed treatments coming down the line as well. Uh, so our first and only new soybean this year uh, comes in the form of the Virtue 1821. This was a, it's a new 1.8 maturity, extremely high yielding. Um, I really liked how it yielded last year and this year in our trials. Um, last year it had extremely high protein as well. Uh, we're still waiting on those results this year. Mac, did you want to talk to this one a little bit? Yeah, so we're, you know, most of the soybeans that get planted in southern Minnesota and northern Iowa are traded soybeans. They're going to be E3s or Extends or maybe GT27s. If you're going to plant conventional non-GMO soybeans, which is, again, all we carry in the Viking brand, you're probably pursuing uh, a non-GMO market uh, where you're going to get a, a premium, maybe a buck, maybe a buck and a half or even more uh, for every bushel of non-GMO beans you grow. So Jake, is, Jake and I are looking for for varieties that will bring that high premium while not sacrificing any yield. And we launched this. Virtue is, so this Virtue is a, a, a brand that was launched nationally in the United States by actually a South American company called Don Mario. And we've licensed, in licensed this variety from them and it, and it retains their national brand name on it, which is the Virtue brand. So this is a yellow hylum, it's very high yielding. I think Jake will testify. It's a really good looking bee, nice, big, tall, bushy plant very good standing. We've been very impressed with it. Unfortunately, it, we don't think it's going to have as high a protein as originally advertised. So you can see up here we said protein was over 44% in our 2020 testing, which would have been super exciting if that remained true because that's a really high protein level. Don't think it's going to hit it this year. I think it's probably more going to be like 40, which isn't going to be that exciting to the food companies. Still a very high yielder. Um, and a yellow hyalum bean, so there's going to be some marketability to it in food markets, but it's not going to have that super high protein, we don't think. Yep. And, and also, really quick, I, I think this one fills a hole in our lineup that we've been missing for a little while in that 1.8 maturity. You know, I feel like we've got a really solid 1.5 and a really solid 2.0, but that, that's a big leap. So I think this one does a really good job of filling that little gap uh, as far as the maturity goes. Uh, a couple other ones that are that are still heavy hitters. I touched on them a little bit earlier. The 0821, <clears throat> definitely my pick if I'm going to plant an early bean coming south. Uh, it, it maintains its height. It maintains its standability. It yields extremely well, even in the absence of rain. Um, uh, so, uh, Central Minnesota, um, University of Minnesota trials, I think it took second or third this year. Last year it was first. Um, so it's yielding right up there with a lot of, be a lot of beans that are you know, a, a full zone later than it. 1518, for me, this is the 1.5 that I compare all other 1.5s to. Uh, I have yet to find one that's going to out yield it and perform as strongly in terms of its bushiness, standability, disease resistance. Um, you know, I say on here, avoid the field's history with white mold. And that was a, a unique situation where it was a beans on beans white mold present the year before, stands to reason it's going to infect even a high tolerant bean uh, the next year. And then the last bean I'll talk about today, <clears throat> uh, just out of the sheer success of it this year, uh, is our Viking 2418. As I said before, this is a bean that took full advantage of those late rains and it put on uh, a lot of yield because of it. Um, taking a lot of different trials here. You can see first place, University of Minnesota, Southern Zone, um, Iowa State trials, took a couple locations there, even all the way down into central Iowa. So the range of motion with this one is extremely well. We've seen this one do good in Ohio. We've seen it do good in all the I states, Minnesota. So really strong performer, really great health. Um, you know, you, it's a little scary, I know, to look at some of these tolerances and see the letters ID, insufficient data, and that's largely because I, 
it's hard to rate a, a variety on a disease if there's no disease present um, as far as the tolerances are concerned. So in my mind, that still means it's an extremely healthy variety that can take a lot of, a lot of hits in terms of diseases. All right, Mac. Right, so I, again, I mentioned that um, all of our uh, soybeans in a Viking bag are gonna be conventional non-GMO beans. And I just wanted to point out that on our website, we have a list, uh, we have a, a clickable list of buyers of non-GMO soybeans and, and other crops as well, like oats, wheat, and barley. So you can go to our website, you can navigate to this page, click on, a, click on the state, or just there's another way to search it as well. And you can go through and look at all the potential buyers of these non-GMO soybeans and non-GMO corn uh, if you're interested in trying to get that premium. All right, we'll stop there and see if uh, there are any questions on varieties or any questions for Jake and I on how we go about picking varieties or anything else. Yep. for those fungicides. Is there any difference between a normal fungicide application that you're seeing? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Yep. I had a question on your tar spot uh, thing you brought up earlier. Is there a different uh, fungicide that you're seeing work better and then the timing of that fungicide to prevent tar spot? Unfortunately, uh, myself, you know, with us not being chemical dealers ourselves, I, I don't have a solid answer for you on that right now. Um, being that it's so new, we have not ourselves done a lot of chemical trials, so I'm, re I'm really relying on some of our genetic providers um, and other universities for that information right now. So I unfortunately just don't have a really solid answer for you. Um, what I can tell you as far as timing wise, there are really, there, there's been two um, onsets of this d particular disease that have, uh, that people are noting. So there's the early onset, which is usually taking place in say early August, um, you know, right after, typically right after uh, pollination during grain fill. That's the one that can really hurt your yields in terms of uh, that grain fill because that, that uh, um, uh, ear leaf is really getting affected um, as well as the, the sheath itself and the, uh, the husk. Um, then there's a the late onset, which usually happens, you know, late August, early September when much of your grain fill is done. Um, so it really comes down to scouting starting in early August. Uh, and if you're starting to see those what literally look like tar spots on those plants, it's a good time to think about getting out there and getting that thing sprayed, um, preventing the spread and preventing that secondary onset. So I'm sorry, I don't have a solid answer on that yet. I'm still, myself still learning and still relying on a lot of universities um, and secondary uh, sources for that information.